Hi, I'm going to cover the details of constructing the power sensor for this Bunten 4200 RF microwatt meter, which I had recently acquired. And uh, as typical, there was no power sensor with this meter, so I set out to construct my own. Uh, upon reading the manual, I discovered uh, this particular section here, page 43, which gives an outline of the uh, schematic for the, the probe. Uh, you can see I did a lot of mock-up here. I changed all the, pretty much all the parts around because um, I just re-gauged the circuit to fit what the, what parts I had on hand. Actually, I just repurposed some components from various RF parts from my bone yard. Uh, it's interesting to note that someone had already suggested using some zero bias diodes here. So I figured uh, if someone's good enough to suggest using some zero bias diodes, well, I'll just show what my mock-up looks like. So we look in, uh, hopefully that's clear enough to see what I had changed. So I've added a, uh, in addition to the, uh, they recommend three wires here, I actually use the guard, guarded cable, which is, it probably had it a little bit better signal integrity, but it's hard to say. I just used it because I had it laying around. So for an enclosure, here's my actual probe, the power sensor, which actually turned out really nice, I think. You can see it got a little bit hot here for me to solder some parts. So we just have the, uh, this is 50 ohm, and then we have the BMC there, and then the cable. I actually had to buy this. This was the only part that I didn't have, uh, 16 bucks off eBay. So I repurposed uh, an attenuator. I found three of these in my bone yard. This is actually a really nice attenuator. I decided to start working on this one. It seems to be good up to about 1.5 gig. Uh, it has uh, latching relays inside of it. It's 12 volt. It's uh, it's nice. Um, I drilled out the, uh, the little coax connector there to use as my strain relief. Turned out real nice. And uh, we'll take a look inside here before we actually check out the calibration of the sensor. Okay, so here's the power sensor with the lid removed. And you'll notice that it's very black inside. That's because I have the entire cavity shielded with uh, anti-static foam. This is uh, just a typical trick for homebrew probes and sensors and the uh, high frequency range. So we didn't, we, I did this so that uh, I didn't have any cavity effects going on inside this steel enclosure. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you use a, a circular enclosure, you can design the diameter such that uh, they gnaw each other out, uh, like the original probes, but uh, I couldn't find anything like that. And it's hard to see, but there's actually another piece that's, uh, that's attempting to uh, mitigate any kind of fringing fields that may come in from ground. So, and there's also some copper foil here coming across the ground. So we do have a very stable ground, and then this is our guard, and then there's another ground back here, which would be the shield. And the guard and shield just end up being the same back at the instrument. But this will mitigate any kind of any fringing between the two. And so we see. There's not really much to it, uh, just typical RF practices here. Get rid of all the copper in between that we don't need. And uh, keep everything point to point. You can see that I, uh, I doubled up the capacitors there in parallel because the, uh, the values I had on hand weren't quite ideal. But the, uh, the figures on this paper do represent what the circuit actually is. You see it just ended up being a, a 2 to 1 ratio between the charge bank here and the uh, coupling, the RF coupling into the circuit. Okay, there we can actually see the, uh, the static foam a little better there. We can see the fringing field collector. It's actually the coil, all three wires are coiled into a loop. I wasn't sure if I should go the toroid or the uh, the fringe field. I really wasn't quite too sure which side of the EM was going to be getting exposed here. Um, I opted for the uh, 
the electric field side just due to the very low currents that are going to be involved on, on the wires themselves obviously the, the case is going to have a higher current but uh, I didn't expect any induction to happen there if I do find some induction I'll end up putting a common mode choice around these two hopefully inside this fringe field somewhere yeah there's our some more static foam there okay now we'll put this back together and uh, show it in operation okay so once attenuator now power probe sensor good enough for me let's see what happens here we have power on, and the first thing we will do is wait for this to settle, and I will zero it. Uh, this is actually a mock-up BNC that I made. The uh, terminal is actually pushed down in there so it doesn't short out. It's actually recommended to let the E-field float on the RF side of these during the zero process. Uh, I'm not going to question why they just recommend it in the manual, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'll zero this guy. I don't have the calibration data entered yet, so we're just using uh, some real rough calibration from a, a previous entry. So there we go, RCC03, which the manual would indicate that it had zeroed. And now we will hook up the uh, power reference. This is 50 ohm on cable and into uh, 50 ohm it looks like I lost my end here well while I go search for that okay <laughs> my end that seems to always work its way off there uh, so we'll hook that up find that things are always more difficult to do while I hold the camera. Okay. So, how's our power look? Looks like we need to calibrate. Alright, so we are on DBM, which would be one milliwatt. There's one milliwatt in power. That's good enough. Okay, so. I have a signal generator set up here, 10.5 megahertz, uh, negative 42 dB. So what we will do, let's turn the terminator back on, go into the signal generator. Now the signal generator is not calibrated, it's, uh, it could be off by, well I'd imagine, uh, probably a percent or so, maybe up to 5%, it's hard to say. At this low of a level, um, I don't have much experience with this particular signal generator. I use it at a much higher power level where it's more reliable. So what do we got? We got negative 41.35 and negative 42. There's probably some reflections going on in here. Don't know how much yet. Um, I see, man, my cable is a little bit loose. You know, it's it's used. It's moved around a lot. But that's, uh, that's close enough for my intents and purposes. So now I will put a T on here. I'm going to go into the, the spectrum analyzer, which I already have sweeping at uh, 10.5 megahertz. Okay. Find a T. Now again, this T might be a 75, might be a 93. I'm not quite sure what it is. For these particular tests, it's not going to matter much. Um, okay. And now, all right. So now we have the signal generator, ten and a half megahertz, negative forty-two point one dB. Let's see if we see that is dB. And we have that coming down to the power sensor, power probe, and it tees off into another 50 ohm into the spectrum analyzer, and there we can see a spectra response. Uh, I said it is set at 10.5 megahertz, 
There's our reference level, negative 45 dB up here for your frequency. There we see about 10.5 megahertz, negative 46 dB. And then we see our power, negative 44. Off a little bit, uh, likewise, some reflections going on. Nothing too great. Okay, so. The second purpose of this video, beyond showing the, the power probe actually in operation, uh, you know, it's somewhat coinciding with the spectrum analyzer, negative 46, and the signal generator, negative 42. Now we're we're in there, it's pretty close. Second reason is that you just can't use a signal or a spectrum analyzer, especially in a fixed range like this to determine total power and the key point in here is total power of uh, the envelope on the ERF spectrum so the power meter is going to show us total power within the dynamic range of the probe which this particular probe as far as my math is suggesting is good between 500 kilohertz and about 1.5 gig which is right about where I intend to work and that's about all the spectrum analyzer is good for uh, if I need, this is a lower end, this is my lowest end spectrum analyzer I own. If I need to uh, get out, I'll go to another spectrum or another spectrum analyzer up here. There, there's a lower there, but uh, this one will do just fine for video because it's very user friendly. And uh, I find that tuning the old analog spectrum analyzers is very tedious while trying to hold a camera and keep things in focus. So I'll just go with the easy guy. Though I, I prefer to use the older equipment, it's much more sensitive. So, how can I show that uh, the total power doesn't match up with what we have on our spectra here? So, to do that, I have a signal generator set up. And the signal generator is set at negative 15 dBm. And there's your frequency is 500 kilohertz, amplitude is negative 15. And we are on square wave so a square wave has a very sharp rise in fall times and it produces harmonics many harmonics and uh, so since we're set at 500 kilohertz it just so happens that uh, 10.5 megahertz coincides with one of these harmonics so whenever I disconnect this cable here and uh, I'm not going to do this I'm going to pause this Okay, sometimes I just need two hands, and that was one of them cases. So now we have the we consider this the uh, signal under test. We again see that we are at 10.5 megahertz, and now we're at negative 47. So the power is actually a little bit lower than what it was right here at negative 42. However, our generator is set at negative 15. Well. When we go look at our power meter, oh, there we go, negative 18. And it's a lot different from negative 45. So, what's happening here? Well, the power meter is measuring total power, not just a single frequency. The spectrum analyzer is tuned in such a way to just exploit this particular frequency right here, 10.5 megahertz with, uh, what is our bandwidth here? So there we're at 10.5 receiver bandwidth is set at uh, 100 kilohertz yeah of course it's not calibrated so we're not looking for an accurate signal but just something in the ballpark 100 kilohertz video bandwidth and the span is set at 502 kilohertz obviously 500 kilohertz would be better but I didn't feel like tuning it in exact so we're only seeing 500 kilohertz wide so if we go to our span here and we start to get wider we'll start to see the uh, the harmonics show up here there we go now we can see oh well there, that's, a, that's a total different picture and all this power was hidden because of the, the span width that we were looking at but that was intentional because a lot of times whenever you're looking at spectra you get so caught up in the detail of the single spectra that's in front of you looking for the uh, the bandwidth and the, the product and all these so on 
that you forget about the total bandwidth and the total power that's on the the cable and by doing this you could easily blow the mixer of a uh, spectrum analyzer up if you were just looking at one particular section especially in this case and uh, and maybe if you have a down the line there's an amplifier hooked up where you can blow your amplifier up uh, if you're just looking at a figure and you're not the figure that you're looking at is not the figure of merit which would be the total power on the line within the, the bandwidth product of the of the cable there and uh, you know of course this disregards if there's any attenuators or filters in line here so having the power meter is just another real quick heads up of hey there's a lot more power on this line than what you're looking at if you're sitting in a fixed span there and even on this fixed span without some heavy DSP the spectrum analyzer is not going to give you a true picture of the total power that's sent here you can get close to it and probably within 10 percent but that's a lot of uh, playing around with DSP settings to bring that figure out it's just a lot easier to have a, a dedicated instrument hanging out ready to give you the figure that you're looking for and uh, with this particular instrument we can upgrade our power sensor here we just build another one for a better frequency range or tune it or in my particular case I'll actually put a uh, attenuator and a uh, filter a tunable filter around it so that I can look into different ranges of power so yeah this is just a, a heads up on looking at total power total RF power versus a, a single node of power so now if we uh, just to demonstrate the uh, there's a the harmonics and we'll put this back into a sine wave here there's sine we're seeing we're still on square so now we're back to sine wave still negative 15 frequency still 500 kilohertz but now we notice on the spectra there's really nothing there because now we got to tweak it in and bring it in at 500 kilohertz which is getting kind of the lower end of this particular analyzer does it set it for 10 kilohertz up but really it's uh I wouldn't really suggest using them much below 500 kilohertz and now we see our power our total power is still 18.21 and what was that before let's see if we change to square wave and a little bit of reflections it's not too bad there should be a way to characterize the uh, the total transmission line there. That's something I'll have to work on. Okay, I think I'm happy with uh, the homebrew power sensor.